Father, may these spoken words be faithful to the written word and lead us to the living word, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, well done indeed. This is a a wonderful adaptation and uh, renovation of this uh, lovely ancient building, which is nearly a thousand years old, is that right? So, ancient and modern, the heritage of yesterday and the needs of today. It's brilliantly done and uh, made really fit for purpose. And you, of course, the people of God, have done it. In the United Kingdom, year on year, we have to raise in our Anglican churches £120 million to maintain and repair our buildings. It's a huge sum. And £85 million of that is raised by the people of God themselves, we the church. So it's a huge demonstration of the importance we attach to our churches. So well done and thank you for doing that in this, our generation. Actually, I love musty old church buildings as well. This is an old building, but not musty. But the mustiness, actually, is often part of the attraction. Do you know what I mean? It's probably to do with uh, the nostalgic effect that smells have on most of us anyway. It's like the smell of tobacco that reminds you of a, of a favorite grandfather, or it's like the freshly cut grass that reminds us of Uh, summer days in our youth, in my case playing cricket or something like that, or a perfume that transports us to um, a lost romance. (laughs) Smells, scents have a tremendous effect. My family and I used to uh, go to a small country village for our summer holidays, and I would enter this ancient church and be greeted by the distinctive smell of old stone and slightly damp prayer books and last week's flowers. It was a heady mixture, which still has an effect on me today. To others, of course, those smells are the stale smell of yesterday's faith. Philip Larkin called it the cold smell of sacred stone. And sometimes you do go into churches and you see the piles of -of out-of-date leaflets and parish magazines, the unsightly bucket of crumbling oasis somewhere in the corner, and a broken chair and an exhausted water heater. And all of these might suggest that if God is not dead, then at least he's well past his prime and spends most of his time at car boot sales. A little boy was uh, fidgeting once as the service droned on, and his mother said, Hush, Martin, this is the house of God. Little Martin looked around, and he saw the old pews and the stone memorials and the cobwebs, and he, he whispered back, he said, Well, if I was God, I'd move. <laughs> But, but not here. You've done it. You've just moved back in, and it's as fresh as a summer morning. So well done. But why is it so important that you've done this? Three things. Firstly, the importance of place. Sacred spaces and, and holy stones are special to most people and the communities that they serve. of people in a recent poll, national poll, said that they'd be really concerned uh, if their church was no longer there. Uh, It's, of course, a much greater percentage than actually come to church. The broadcaster, uh, Jeremy Paxman, he wrote this recently, church spires, and by extension I take it he means church towers, uh, are the great punctuation points of the English countryside. But the religious buildings of this country not only tell where we are geographically, They tell us where we've come from. They're often the only place in a community which has a living, visible connection to the past. They hotwire us into our history. End of quote. Great phrase, I think. They hotwire us into our history. So churches have a, a symbolic value far beyond their address or their postcode. They carry the emotional and spiritual investment of the community and they remind us don't they of of baptisms and midnight mass and special occasions weddings and 
prayers in times of war and funerals and all sorts of things. These places are holy ground, even for the unbeliever. They carry people's sacred memories. When I worked at uh, Canterbury Cathedral, I was once walking through the, the cloisters and uh, I saw a man just sitting there looking very ruminative and I greeted him gently and he came straight out, straight out and he just said, this place saved my life. Ten years ago I'd come to the end and this place saved me. It didn't seem right to push further. We were on holy ground. And that's why I think people keep these places and care for them so deeply. And we, people commit themselves to the upkeep of these places, even if they don't come to worship here. 86% of people, after all, go into a church at some point in the year, for all kinds of reasons. 30% go to a church for a Sunday service sometime in the year. 40% go to a baptism. 50% to a wedding. 60% to a funeral. These are popular places. And when there aren't many people around, there are always the angels crowding the rafters and brushing gently against the people who drop in for a quiet moment. Simon Jenkins, he's not a believer, but he recognizes the power of sacred space. He wrote this, The evening was warm and the gloaming was rising from the valley beneath. Through a churchyard hung low with trees, I could sense the air filling with the ghosts of villagers climbing up the hill to that tiny building. I sensed their coming for a thousand years. As they arrived, they hurled their hopes against those walls, wept on altars, and filled the rafters with their cries. The church had received their faith and offered in return a humble consolation, now mute in death. These people communicated to me as they did to Eliot, tongued with fire beyond the language of the living. I could not be immune to the spirits of such a place. Nor can most people. These places speak. Of course, if God is as we say he is and present everywhere, in every place, then we can meet God anywhere, in any place, on a mountain or in a living room or in the proverbial garden. Indeed, in the United States, uh, they even have drive-in churches. Did you know that? You can come by car. And uh, the, new, the weekly news sheet of, um, of one drive-in church had this wonderful request. It said, please do not start engines until the pastors have left the altar. <laughs> can you believe it? For most of us, however, it's a special place. It's a building that acts as a porch into the presence of the divine. Space opens up. Time slows down. Love comes through. Crisis comes, of course, when a church needs altering to suit the needs of a new generation and its contemporary mission. I'm sure it wasn't so here, but talk about fur flying is to underestimate what happens in some places. We're now talking muskets at dawn and uh, I used to be an archdeacon and I know about these things. Pity the poor vicar who simply wants to keep the church warm and welcoming and uh, to have the place ready for a toddler group or some midweek group or course. And then there are petitions to receive and there are church council meetings to face and there's anguished parishioners to calm down and there's a threat of Mrs. Bucket tying herself to the pew and all of that. Behind it hangs the, uh, the spectre of a, a sinister-sounding consistory court uh, where unsuspecting vicars are boiled in oil. Nevertheless, there just has never been an era when buildings were not adapted to suit the needs of a new age. It has always been the case. Aisles were built, doors and windows were opened up, paintings were added and removed, pews were introduced late on of course very interesting that it's pews you need here I take it to to get the numbers in that's 
like in Blackpool, actually, where I come from, where you have to have trams because there's no other way of getting people up and down the front in such huge numbers. Anyway, sorry, that's by the way. Um, <laughs> but all these things have happened, and, and organs have come in, and vestries have been enlarged, and fonts have moved, and bells have been hung, and there have always been changes taking place in our churches. They're never static. And the Victorians, of course, changed them all. 85% of the churches in this country uh, were altered by the Victorians some from the bottom up. So why should a missionary impetus not mean the introduction of comfort and flexibility, heating, lighting, sound systems, sometimes chairs instead of pews, liturgical space instead of Victorian clutter? Of course it's necessary. The old stones were put there for the benefit of the living stones, as St. Peter called the early Christians. And living stones need to breathe the fresh air of the Spirit. Most of all, of course, uh, we now need that omnipresent facility of the modern age, the loo. Now, you don't need that here, do you, because it's close by, but in really up-to-date churches, I've also come across uh, the baby-changing facilities that are needed. In one church, there was a, uh, they were searching for a text to put uh, by those facilities, and they eventually found it. It comes from 1 Corinthians 15. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> But in truth, our church buildings have to reflect the needs of, of contemporary mission or else they become museums where the spirit dies. So well done to you for, for doing this. The church is an embodiment of stone, in stone for what Christ says to his church and to his world. It's a theatre for life-giving worship. It's a centre for, for listening and forgiving. It's an arena for celebration and for suffering. It's a demonstration of love in stone. But of course, this, this isn't the church. The church is different. Do you remember when you were small, some of you, um, doing that little thing that goes like this? Um, here's the church and here's the steeple. Open the doors and there are all the people remember that? Well, shall we do it? Let's, let's just um, let's put that piece of paper down and let's just do this. So you put your hands together like that and we say, here's the church and here's the steeple. Open the doors and there are all the people. Anyone over 50 will know how to do that, I think. <laughs> but the point is, you know, here are all the people. This is the church. It's you. It's us. The church is is what's left when the building has burnt down. That's not Darcy's and policy, by the way. But the writer to the Ephesians, Paul said, if it's Paul said, you are no longer strangers and aliens, you are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. What a fabulous description that is. Not outsiders, not strangers and aliens, but we belong with the saints. We are citizens with the saints. You may well be sitting next to a saint. Unless it's your husband and wife, in which case you know better. <laughs> but, but in any case, that is how God sees you. He sees you as the saints, his holy ones. And don't try and deny it, if I may say. God thinks you're the bee's knees. He really does. So Paul says, he calls us members of the household of God being members of the royal household only infinitely better buildings are marvellous places but they're not what we're really about a few years ago I, I took part in the great Easter celebrations in Durham Cathedral where I was working at the time as Bishop of Jarrow and it was wonderful, a great occasion and the angels were singing and terrific, but the next Sunday after that I was in the middle of the Sinai Desert sharing the peace with, um, just, we were just under one solitary tree. It's the only tree for miles around in the burning sun, and we were celebrating this service with four bemused Bedouin tribesmen who didn't know quite what was happening uh, and singing Thine Be the Glory with gusto. And we didn't need a building. What we did need was the risen Christ and us, the church. 
You are the church. And this church would not be what it is without you, everyone. Every one of you gifted, everyone making this church what it is. So we celebrate a building, a special place to so many. We celebrate a people, living stones in this place. And thirdly, we also celebrate a vision that undergirds what we are and we're about as a building and as a people. And that vision is of the kingdom of God. A kingdom where everyone lives under the blessing of God and seeks to be a blessing to others. The church flourishes when it keeps that vision of the kingdom. When it narrows down to just doing its own religious activities, it's lost the plot. But when it's seeking first the kingdom of God, a kingdom of peace and justice, a kingdom of transformed society, then all is well. There was a, a notice in the foyer of a hotel in Paris, I'm told, which said, leave your values at the front desk. Well, that's just what the church mustn't do. We bear witness, and particularly in this period of a, an election coming up, we bear witness to a different vision for society, a different set of values. Leslie Newbegin was a bishop in um, South India, and he once went to a, a service in a church, and he said to the elders afterwards, he said, uh, so what's this church for? And they scratched their heads for a while, and eventually they said, well, we're here to serve the needs of our members. So Bishop Leslie Newbegin said, well, you should be closed down immediately. We are not here for the well-being of our members, and though that's an offshoot, that's a, we get caught up in the slipstream of, uh, of the kingdom work, and that may happen. But actually we are here not to be in the business of collecting Christians and putting them into a safe place. We're here, actually, to make a difference to that bit of creation in which we are set, which is here, Finchamstead. We're here to be the first fruits of the new creation, the kingdom of God, that Jesus spoke about, the advance guard of the kingdom. Trying to work out practically what the contours of the kingdom look like in contemporary society. Trying to help people to flourish in every way possible. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of the common good or the kingdom of relational justice or the kingdom of intentional peace. All kinds of descriptions you can give it. But the church has to be the grit in the oyster that makes something beautiful. But it has to keep asking difficult questions about issues, great and small, national and international. Keep asking the questions. We have a vision. It's an uncomfortable vision to a society saturated with consumption, with buying and wasting, entertaining ourselves to death. And we keep that vision of the kingdom intact by coming here week by week and rehearsing that vision and exploring it and enjoying it. What a lot to celebrate in one ancient church. Small in size but growing in numbers all the time. You have so much to offer this community and the wider communities into which you are networked. And it's based on a building, a people, and a vision. So thank you for the inspiration, as I said, for to so many other people and to me for the vision that, uh, that you carry and the inspiration you give. May the Lord bless you and bless you kindly as we dedicate this place afresh to him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>